Professor T. Jane Turner is director of the Center for Space Science and Technology. After receiving a BS degree in mathematics and astronomy, she received a PhD in physics. Dr. Turner worked previously for the University Space Research Association and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center before joining UMBC full-time as a professor of physics. Her research includes the use of x-rays to study phenomena in space, including the properties of black holes. Please welcome Dr. Turner to tell us, here be dragons. I'm here to tell you about supermassive uh, black holes in galaxy nuclei. And uh, the title of my talk, it relates to historic seafaring maps where people would mark um, here be dragons where there was something that was completely unknown. And so I, I like to use that analogy. So if you want to understand the universe, the best place to start looking is essentially in your own backyard. And what you can see on the left is some of the star orbits close to our galaxy's center, the Milky Way center. And so up in the top right-hand corner of that, you can see the year clicking by. So this is data taken over a few years. Each of those points is a star, and you can see its orbit being traced out. Then the little star icon marks an unseen object. You can't see any light from it, but it's what the position of something that's exerting gravitational influence and causing those star stars to orbit the way that you can see. So if we put the orbital data together in the right-hand plot, each of those black points represents one of those stars, and you can see on the x-axis its distance away from this mysterious object. And on the y-axis, because we understand physics and we have laws of gravity, we can use those orbits to figure out the mass that these stars are orbiting around. So from looking at these stars, we can find out that in the center of our Milky Way galaxy, there's a black hole of 2.6 million solar masses, so 2.6 million times the mass of our star. And yet we can't see it except for its gravitational influence. We wouldn't know it's there. So we can go out and look and see if this is typical for galaxies. Is there something special about the Milky Way, or is this true for other galaxies. And this is a picture showing the wealth of other galaxies out there. They're all different sizes and shapes. And if we do a survey, we can go and do a similar measurement in other galaxies. So look at stellar orbits or other indicators of a large gravitating mass in galaxy nuclei. So when we do that, what we find is remarkable that there's evidence for some supermassive black hole at the center of all galaxy nuclei. And this is one of the big discoveries of the last decade or so in astronomy. So we can do something more sophisticated, which is to go and make a measurement of those masses in the way I just described. And that's plotted on the y-axis. And we can also measure the amount of mass in the host galaxy that this thing is residing in. And that's shown on the x-axis, and you can see numbers. The larger galaxies have about a trillion stars, 10 to the 12 stars. And what you'll immediately see is that there's a correlation between these two quantities. So this is a remarkably good correlation as things go in physics. The larger mass, bulge mass, um, is approximately the same as the, the total mass of the galaxy. So the larger mass galaxies seem to have the biggest, most massive black holes. This tells us something very important, that these things must grow together. If they didn't grow together, then you sometimes get a low mass black hole in a very massive galaxy. So this remarkably strong correlation means they must grow together. And this is very important in understanding the connection between black holes and galaxies and the growth of structure in the universe on the whole. So, most of these, as I've just said, you can uh, detect them by their gravitational influence. It turns out a few percent are lit, lit up, they're turned on. And these are the ones we call active galactic nuclei. So in a few percent of cases, something about the system is causing a large amount of light to come out from close to that black hole. Most of them look quiescent, just a few look very bright. And these two pictures show you the contrast in how those two cases look. On the left, we've got a beautiful spiral galaxy. The black hole in that case is quiescent. On the right, what you can see, that very bright object, is actually a galaxy as well. 
it looks like a star. So in that right-hand frame, you can see a bright point source, and that cross shape is to do with the instrument that took the picture. A little to the left of it is a star. You can't tell them apart. You just think that in the bottom right, it was a brighter star. But the bottom right is an active galaxy, and it's a million times further away than that star in the same picture. And because the intensity of radiation falls off as one over distance squared, that means it must be more than a million times a million times brighter than that star. So these are incredibly powerful things. And for a long time, we didn't understand the nature of them. Some of them are so bright, you can't even tell that they're in galaxies. So we're back to our survey of the universe. We've established that every galaxy's got a supermassive black hole between a million and a billion solar masses. Just a few of them are switched on. So why are those switched on, and what does that tell us fundamentally about how the universe has come to look the way it looks? So if we look a little bit closer at the nucleus of some of these systems, maybe we can figure out how they're producing so much light. And our thought is that material must be streaming somehow from the galaxy on towards the black hole, falling down that gravitational potential well, like water down a drain hole. So this red stream of material is an artist's representation of material falling in under the gravitational influence of the unseen black hole. And that black hole will be at the center there. You can't see it, but you can see a lot of radiation coming from close to it. So as material falls in in that gravitational potential, the, uh, the disk that's formed has a lot of friction in it and so radiates um, a lot of light. And that's how we convert the gravitational potential energy into radiative energy. And that's the fundamental source of energy, we think, close to the black hole of these active galactic nuclei. So the size of that region, that disk I just showed, uh, is very close to the black hole. So the size of that black hole and its immediate environs is roughly the size of our solar system. And just to give you some idea of the perspective on that, this active nuclear region compared to the galaxy scales the same way as an orange to the size of the Earth. So this is a very small region at the center of a galaxy. And yet, it can dominate the light that you see. So how are we getting this energy out and what can we learn from that? You remember E equals mc squared, the simplest form of Einstein's famous equation that tells you how to extract energy from mass and how much energy you'll get by destroying mass. So in real life, there's some efficiency factor associated with that. You might not completely destroy some mass and extract all of the energy. You might extract a little bit of it. So I've got some examples here of a petrol gas engine. We've got this factor of 5 times 10 to the minus 11. That's a very small efficiency for that process. So we're looking at measuring a large amount of light from a region that we know is tiny. What process is consistent with producing that much power in such a small space? We have to step through some of the other things we know that are a bit more efficient. Well, how about nuclear fusion? That's what powers stars individually. Maybe we can cram enough into this small space and produce enough light. We know the efficiency of nuclear fusion. And up here, we've increased by a factor of 100 million to have E equals 0 0.005 mc squared, and C is the speed of light. So it turns out even that isn't um, a, an explanation for the amount of light we see. So we step things up a little bit more and go to what we call accretion. Accretion, in essence, is that movie I just showed you, that stream of material falling down, losing gravitational potential energy, getting close to the black hole. That can be very efficient. It's got an efficiency maybe up to 10%, so we could have E equals 0.1 mc squared. It turns out that does match the observables that we see. But that mass is the mass that's accreting. It's not the mass of the black hole. So we know how much energy we see. We can measure the amount of light we see and figure out how much mass we need to tear apart in order to produce that through this accretion process. And it turns out the answer is less than one solar mass per year. So if we can shred one star per year, we can feed these active nuclei. So it doesn't take much when you think about the fact that these galaxies, as I mentioned earlier, have about a trillion stars in them. So why are x-rays interesting? And this is what I've devoted my life's work to. 
This is, again, an artist's impression of very close in to the center of that thing, this tiny, tiny region. The black hole's hidden somewhere down in the middle of that white area. This is the shape of the material as it gets close to the black hole from theoretical models. So we think we've got this gas swirling in. Of course, we don't see anything from within the event horizon, but we can see things going on just outside of that. And that's where we're learning about how these things work. So if we look in detail, we expect the X-rays to come from very close to the event horizon. It's the frequency of light where we can observe things that are right down in that region of interest. So let's look at some X-rays and see what we can learn about the immediate environs of the black hole. And we need to use satellites to do this. And the picture at the top shows you why. The picture at the top is photon frequency, and it's showing how far into the Earth's atmosphere those photons penetrate. And you know that the visible light comes all the way down to the ground. We're used to seeing ground-based optical telescopes and also radio telescopes, such as the one at Greenbank. But if you can see those black lines, the X-rays don't make it all the way through the atmosphere. So we need to put a satellite up high enough to measure things from other galaxies in the X-ray band. So at the bottom, I've got some of the current X-ray missions that are in flight. On the bottom right of particular interest is the Chandra X-ray satellite, which is the X-ray equivalent of Hubble Space Telescope. So what do we measure when we go up and look at some of these galaxy nuclei with our X-ray satellites? We can make a spectrum, and that's shown in this panel at the bottom left. So what a spectrum is, is a measure of, on the y-axis, how many photons you're getting versus some measure of the photon energy. So whether you've got soft x-rays like you use in the dentist's office or harder x-rays with more energy. So we're measuring uh, how many photons there are at each of those different x-ray energies. And you can see a lot of bumps and wiggles. So these bumps and wiggles tell us that the x-rays are interacting with gas close to the black hole. And the details of those bumps and wiggles tell us the physical state of the gas, how ionized it is, how excited it is, what the chemical composition is, what the kinematics are. Is it flowing out from the black hole, flowing into the black hole, or swirling around it? And how much of that stuff is there? So in the X-ray band, we can make a measure of the state of the material close to the event horizon, and whether it's moving inwards or outwards. And this is how we're going to be able to understand the connection between the growth of this black hole and the host galaxy. We want to understand the material flow in through this accretion process and then whether some is being returned back out to the galaxy. Is there this strong connection? And I'm showing a cover from Nature. And on the team were two visiting scientists to UMBC in the last couple of years. So this has a connection with our institution. And it made the cover of Nature. It's showing the disk around a black hole. And the disk is this accreting material. So that's the stuff moving in. And then these authors discovered that a lot of that material is lifted from the surface of the disk and then pushed back out into the galaxy. And that's the swirly pattern that you can see coming off the surface. And what was most important and why this made the cover of Nature was because they measured that there's enough of that material, that it's carrying a lot of mass and energy back from the nuclear regions back into the host galaxy, is to the degree that it would affect star formation in the host galaxy. And this was the best measurement of that process that had been made to date. So that was a, a, a big step forward. So just to summarize, we've got supermassive black holes in the center of all galaxy nuclei. And studying these is important to understanding the growth of structure in the universe. So we, we can learn a number of things. We can also use this as a, a, an extreme laboratory for physics. It's a strong gravity regime. We can't study anywhere else in the universe. So we're getting an opportunity to study extreme physics and ultimately to understand how the universe grew to look the way it looks today. Thanks.